although my work is about nature and the landscape, I have a base knowledge of maybe bees, but not very much. It's like things that you kind of pick up from stories, maybe. So I thought that this would be a fantastic opportunity to then observe bees on a big estate uh, with the different habitats, and then me learn about that, but also kind of uh, relay that, and kind of relay that through the exhibition. Being an apprentice beekeeper was the most fascinating thing I've ever done. And we could really only do that on site in the nature reserve because it was cut off from the public at the time. So that was incredible. And of course that's fed into the exhibition. The maps and the pressings represent the time on the residency at York Sculpture Park. So the maps document monthly all the species of bee that I found and, and including honeybees. And then the pressings um, are the plants that I collected uh, during the residency that I noticed that bees were feeding on. So there's Himalayan balsam here and um, field scabious and then a lime tree and common poppy. And this is just a small representation of the pressings that I collected and then obviously I noted all the other plants as well. I've worked out my own labelling system and a stamp um, uh, because there are things that I think are important to label uh, and it doesn't have to be scientific to make it uh, valuable. So uh, obviously I'm, I value them in a different way maybe, so it's aesthetic. Um, but also in this instance I'm putting what I've observed bee-wise on them, so which kind of bees might be feeding on them and if they really, really love it. So that's what I'm noting in this instance. You wouldn't normally get those things listed on a, a conventional herbarium pressing sheet. I've gone and put different symbols for the different species of bees, but they remain throughout. So Bombus terrestris is always across on the map. It, it's revealed where all the bees that I've spotted them. So I wasn't here every single day. So obviously there might be gaps in the map because I just didn't go there. So they're not strictly scientific survey work. It's my observation. So of course it's a different thing. So it's sort of scientific, but really it's mainly artistic. One for each month, so you can kind of see how at the beginning, in the first bay in March, I only noted uh, um, yeah, a, a couple of species, Bombus terrestris, it's the queens emerging from winter. But then you can see how they build up and then uh, how many different species we've got. Uh, the honeybees were introduced on site at the boathouse in April. So obviously they have a, a massive representation on the map, sort of around the boathouse. But then also found solitary bees and obviously the different bumblebees. Ivor Flatman is the regional bee inspector and he kind of was in charge of the beehives down here at, at the boathouse and on the nature reserve. And we needed that expertise really because I am a complete beginner and I needed to observe him doing all the work to do with beekeeping and it was amazing and he's a very patient man <laughs> because uh, I would ask him the same questions again and again and, and I know he gets that with every talk that he does like people's fascination with bees and the and the um, kind of the life cycle of a bee is really uh, like everybody wants to know about it so I had the same questions but then I also talked to quite a lot of other people there was uh, a couple of people who helped me with the bee identification there was uh, Brian Robinson and he's an e ecologist and he helped me, he came here and helped me sort of survey the site and I, it, it, I worked out that obviously I was sometimes not even looking in the right places so there's the obvious bumblebees but then looking for solitary bees was something completely different and he kind of helped me with that. And then uh, because we found some of them tricky to ID we then went to the uh, uh, Liverpool Museum where they've got a big collection of uh, bee specimens. So uh, Carl Clee has helped with the idea of those. But then also I met a forensic entomologist. On my blog I put that it was somebody that tries to de detect crime with a highly trained team of bees. Well obviously that's not true. Um, <laughs> it's if, if you find a body you can tell how long it's been dead by uh, the kind of insects that have hatched out on it. I think I'm getting that correct. He is at the University of Central Lancashire. The bee boxes are, are, are an extension of uh, the photographs that I took with Adam Wilcox at the university. Um, he let me use all the microscopes and the, the macroscopes there. And it reveals the most gloriously beautiful world in the close-ups of the bees. Now, I've, I've, only, been, I've only picked three, which, which was difficult actually. And, and they're not very obvious, the ones that I've chosen. But I've done them so that they're sort of backlit and you have to 
look quite closely at them. I wanted you to be drawn to them and, and kind of spend that time uh, inspecting like a very close up bit of a bee. I've deliberately not used any sound in the exhibition. It's that sound of bees I kind of wanted to omit from the exhibition. I spent ages and different times, different times of day, different weather, recording the bees on a digital recorder, but then I've translated it on the computer into frequency. And you, and you could begin to see the patterns emerging that when, obviously, you were closer to the hive or when they're angry or when they're a little bit calmer or when bees are passing the microphone, uh, obviously there's different patterns emerging, so I've then transcribed that onto paper. And I thought that they were really like a wonderful way of translating the sound, sort of visually translating sound. The solitary bee prints, I, I was intrigued at how difficult it was to actually identify them. Not only do they not quite look like bees or how we imagine a bee to look like, actually getting a final identification was really tricky. And, and, and definitely for, for me, I, had, I couldn't do it you go through a key to work out what species it is. I had to get permission of George Els to use his identification text, which I think is on the one hand incredibly complicated and complex, but at the same time using such interesting language that I wanted to put that into the prints. So that's what the solitary bee prints are about. It's like this tiny little insect demands so much attention, if you see what I mean, which I quite like. At the print rooms at the University of Central Lancashire, there's Magda Sparska Bevin and Tracy Hill have both helped me with the screen printing. I'd always known that there was different species, but it had never occurred to me how many or that then the different stripes might represent the different species. But obviously when you say that, it's obvious. And it is about the combination of stripes and whether it's male or female and maybe how old it is, in which case some of its stripes kind of get a bit worn. So it got more complicated the more species came out and then I, I then was capturing them and IDing them and then letting them go uh, and, and that kind of helped but it still was pretty tricky actually because some of them are very similar to each other. Doing the bee stripe pictures was my way of trying to memorise the bee stripe combinations and also I really like the Latin names for them. They're all uh, quite similar which doesn't help in you trying to remember. So the bee stripes are similar and also the Latin is quite similar. From other projects I've collected specimens of insects and obviously in this instance it's, it's bees. I actually only collect them from everywhere I go, so windowsills or on the pavement or like you do. But with the uh, honeybees on the, on the bottom two shelves of the little hole in the wall, I've collected all the honeybees from around the bottom of the hive so when the bees have died, they, I mean bees are very clean, they'll uh, clean out their hive so then the dead ones are on the ground around the bottom and so I was able to collect those. I've also separated some of them to show you the difference between the drones. I've got some dead drones and I've got some uh, female worker bees as well. And then above that there's three shelves of collected bumblebees which are really beautiful. I mean some of them are pretty squashed and look like they've been run over but they, they sort of have preserved themselves. If you dry them out then they're easy to keep really. Beyond that, in the, in the bay beyond that, um, I've done artist's impressions of my idea of um, introducing two meadows on site. Uh, because uh, during the time of the residency, I noticed that the bees were only feeding on particular areas, on, on, the, on the grounds, and I thought that uh, maybe for such a big site, 500 acres, there should be uh, yeah, habitat introduced, particularly for the bees. And so my proposal is to uh, introduce two plots, each an acre each, one made entirely of blue uh, meadow flowers and one of yellow uh, meadow flowers. And they're an acre each because that would positively help the local populations of bees. So in, in that part of the exhibition that is my artist's impressions of where you could have them on the park and, and a, a scale model uh, sort of showing you the 3D representation of of the size of them and, and how they would look, sort of. And in, a, in a cabinet in that part of the exhibition, I, I've written out my proposal which shows the two uh, lists of plants, so you've got the list of species, and I also did um, uh, pH tests and nitrate tests of the soil so that I could work out which plants would uh, be suitable for the um, 
for the site here and because of that we've done two test plots outside the gallery uh, a, a lot smaller but they've got my list of plants in just to see how they will take um, but, but during the time of me proposing the two meadows um, how do I put it there, there was a point where the meadows looked like they might uh, be achieved but at a certain point the, the whole of the Yorkshire Sculpture Park estate has been locked into a Natural England higher level stewardship scheme and that means that they can only manage it in a particular way and it's to preserve the parkland which of course is a particular habitat, it's um, uh, grazed, uh, sort of re responsibly grazed uh, parkland with the big trees and unfortunately because of that and that the land is locked into this kind of management regime we can't have the meadows. Um, so the last part of the exhibition, not only is it my uh, artist impressions of what you could have, it also explains why we can't have it and how the politics and sort of commerciality of landscape has stopped us um, being able to plant the meadows in reality, which is a shame. So, so when I've been surveying the park and walking around with my net, loads of people talk to me about bees and everybody loves bees and everybody is aware of the threat to bees and I think what's really encouraging is everybody uh, that I spoke to uh, not only is aware of it but wants to do something about it. So they're all planting things in their garden or they are um, reading up more about bees or uh, coming to exhibitions like this. And I think that that is really encouraging in the... Um, because bees have been in the press a lot about the decline of species numbers in the landscape and that's one in really encouraging thing about this is that everybody <laughs> loves bees. Maybe that's a positive thing. When I first proposed the project I said it would be interesting to look at the honeybees, on, like introduce honeybees on site, but also look at bumblebees and solitary bees and when I started the project it became obvious that each subject is actually pretty uh, vast, but also potentially a subject in itself. So it has been interesting that I've started looking at solitary bees, but I've only really scratched the surface of those. Um, yeah, and it would be interesting to maybe go further with that. It's incredibly technical. The bumblebees, I've loved looking at the bumblebees. I think they're uh, my favourite. The honeybees, it was absolutely amazing becoming a beekeeper, but at the same time I think I'll now never become a beekeeper uh, for various different reasons, like time constraints. But it was amazing to observe the whole practice and yeah, and to obviously watch the life cycle of bees so close. I I've loved having the opportunity to investigate a site so closely for such an amount of time and having uh, that uh, chance to um, explore every single part of the estate and then be able to uh, yeah, look at bees so closely. It's been an amazing experience and it's taught me a lot about how I feel about the landscape and how I look at species and also how other people look at species. I think that's been amazing. Loved it. <laughs>